It's casual, not formal. It's hosted by Rory Pendlin. Oh, and Renee in tow. It's time to start the show. One, two, three, go! <laughs> Welcome to another episode of It's Casual. I, I, this is like episode 75 now, I think. I, I don't know. Uh, let me bring up uh, the lovely Renee Jaworski, my co-host for this. Hello, hello, Good the life of a performer. I just, I just, just got ready right this instant. Didn't you have a different hair hat on about three seconds? Yes, ago? and I didn't like it. You know, my, my mirror is actually television. I just, you know, I don't use a mirror. I don't have time, right? So I just look at the, I looked at myself in, in this when the credits were going and I said, no, we're going to do this one. And, and where are you today? What, what have you got behind you there? I see, you know, I don't know. This looks like a beautiful mansion and or some kind of a gallery or maybe a theater. I don't know. I'm, you know. Oh Galleries and theaters and things. Okay. Galleries, <laughs> galleries and theaters and things. Oh my, oh my. Uh, we have a couple of birthdays. Uh, it's Mariah's birthday today. Uh, in yes. our community. And uh, I, uh, Jamie Bennett's birthday is around now too. She's, it's coming up. Yeah, yeah, we love Jamie and we love Mariah. These are integral um, cogs on the machine that is Cosmos, right? So yeah. Um, as you know, a long time ago, I was a stand-up comedian, and I, I did a lot of comedy with a lot of different people, and mm -hmm. uh, I stumbled across a video of a guy that I worked with many, many years ago in Florida, uh, and he's doing very well for himself. He's an author. He's been on many TV shows. Uh, he's, he's out there doing comedy, so making people laugh. That's that's what it's all about, especially today. We need more laughter today. We and need more laughter. And he's doing gloom out there. It's, it's like when your parents force you to go to Baptist church on Sunday. You know, it's all doom and gloom. <laughs> Come on. How about an uplifting message? How about something to make me smile? And we don't want any hate mail from the Baptists. We, we love Baptists. <laughs> Let's just say that right now. If you're Baptist, it, we, it's okay. <laughs> yeah, you're, you're, you're doing the right thing. Uh <laughs> <laughs> we don't want to offend the Baptists. This Rory, no, they're at least twelve percent of this audience. At least twelve percent of the audience is. Back. I, 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 I do uh, enjoy a good baptism. Uh, yes, <laughs> of course, it's wonderful. To, yes. to cleanse in the holy waters, I, I, mm -hmm. I do like that. I will say that. Yes. Um, yes. So anyway, this comedian Mike Lucas. Uh, uh, let me let me uh, share with you the clip that I stumbled across. And I was like, oh, I remember that bit. That's great. That's fair. That's brilliant. All right. Here it is. Let's. I like that jacket. Me too. Me too. I just couldn't get out of bed. Actually, I could get out of bed. I just couldn't get out of my bedroom. I would get about <laughs> as far as my bedroom door before my bed would try to seduce me. <laughs> Back into bed. It was bullshit. It was early. I was easy. It was the times. You know? I tried really hard too because it was a great job. I was like trying. I was like, I gotta go to work. Come on, Jesus. This is such a good opportunity. You're blowing it. God. I was late four times last week, <laughs> and I was off on Friday. Come on, let's do this. Let's be a man. Grow up. Go to work, Michael. <laughs> Bed, <laughs> Michael. You look good. <laughs> Thanks, bed. It's just my sleepy pants. It's really early in the morning, bed. You look good yourself. <laughs> God, you're firm. I could boss a quarter off of you. Jesus. I love the way you slept on me last night, Michael. God, your body felt so good. Uh, 
I know better than top you for almost five hours. Yeah. <laughs> yes, I was. I couldn't last it a lot longer than that, you know. You were the big sleeper. Shut up, I'm not saying that. I'm not saying that. <laughs> I was ready for you. God, you look good. Fuck, I'm running late. I gotta go. Michael. Seely, what? <laughs> Just come over here and lay down on me. I love to. I would so love to, Celia. I don't have time. We can make it a quick heel. We'll call it a nap. <laughs> you know you want a nap. I know I want a nap. Oh, damn, man. Of course I want a nap, Betty, Betty, Betty. That's not the point. <laughs> That's not the point. I got to go to work. You like your clean sheets? Daddy's got to make some laundry quarters. Yeah. Oh, look at you still warm under the quilt. That feels good deeper. Don't start. Don't. Come on. Not cool, bed. I got to go. I want you to rub your bald head between my cool, fluffy pillows. All right, you know what? What do you want from me? What do you want? Make the noise. Okay. Okay. Okay, uh, it goes down. So funny. It, <laughs> but a wonderful, wonderful analogy. <laughs> we can all relate to that. We can all, and I like the finger too. I like there's a lot of, a lot of this. We all have our, our little uh, love relationship with our beds. Uh, oh, yes. Let's bring him on up. Uh, Mike Lucas. Hey, guys. <laughs> nice. Um, weren't, weren't you wearing a different hair hat a few minutes ago? <laughs> I, 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 you know, I can't have Renee go ahead and try to one up my my uh, hair gorgeousness. So I, I decided to. Um, I like this one. I like this one because this brings me back to um, when I was sort of a teenager. You know, you part in the hair, you feather it back. You kind of got it's, it's a kind of a mullet. It's like the hint of a mullet, but it's sort of. It's, no, yeah. you know what they say that it's, it's business in the front and it's party in the back. Right. Business in the front and party in the back. I think I should have a gun and I should run into a room and freeze, you know, creep or whatever. You, you look a little like Paul McCartney. <laughs> a little bit like Paul McCartney. Yeah, like the wings version, the wings there. I, I was actually uh, starting to sweat under that wig. I, I don't, um, I typically, my characters don't last long enough to um, sweat that much, but. Uh, <laughs> Oh yeah, yeah. You forgot the one big line from that um, from that bit was, um, you know, Michael, I want you in me, and that's yeah. the, that's the, the maybe, maybe that's what you're trying to avoid showing your crowd uh, the, <laughs> that dirty, filthy punchline there. Um, but uh, yeah, that's funny. That bit, I actually ended up doing that bit. I call it the bed seduction bit, and I ended yeah. up doing that bit on the Tonight Show when I got uh, um, put on the Tonight Show um, back. This is back in 1996. And yeah. people thought I was was dirty because I did that bit. I, there was, you know, the innuendo. So they figured that um, I was, I was. Um, they thought you were blue, huh? Well, I mean, I am. <laughs> they <thought right. laughs> but they thought I was blue on on TV, and and I, I kind of took it as close to the edge as I could. Like, like that bit. That bit was pretty. Um, but but I never said anything. I never cursed, and I never said anything over. Right. The line. They they approved the bit. They they have to approve the bits before you do them on on. On the air. That's true. That's true. And um, so they 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 knew what they were getting into, and they knew uh, how close it was going to go. <laughs> they had to. Like like the, I also did a golf bit on that on that set, and um, the mm -hmm. bit um has me um doing the noise effect of the uh of um of the golf club, and I I, I swing it and I throw it and I swear so I go shoot, I go shoot, yeah, fuck it in the in the real. <laughs> I don't know if I can swear on this one, but but on yes, the, you can. You can swear on this show. Okay, I, I thought so, but I I, I should probably ask. <laughs> um, we were talking about Baptist earlier, so I, I so I figured we could swear, but I don't know. <laughs> but uh, but so so I, I instead of saying shit, I said shit, and instead of saying fuck it, I said bucket, and then I said you know, choo, choo, choo. and so so everyone thought I had cursed and done that bit, but I said no, I said bucket. You can say bucket on on national. <laughs> So that, that was back when Leno was uh, was the host, right? Oh, yeah, yeah, that was he was still yeah, well, you know going on over the couch. Yeah. Right. People don't understand what a great comedian he was. They they kind oh, of yeah. got him for being a mediocre host because he would interrupt people and try to get the joke in. But as a comedian, he was top notch. He was. He still. was awesome. That's 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 why he ended up you know going on the Letterman show so many times. Yeah. You know, which led to him you know getting the job you know replacing Carson. Yeah, and he would he would. Uh, guest host is probably what you're referring to. Yeah. And, and he would go on there as a guest and then they would banter, but then sometimes he would, 
um, guest host the show on the Tonight Show before he was ever the host, and so people got to see how how he could do that. But yeah, but that all started with him doing many appearances on Letterman, though, and doing his stand up and doing um, kind of yeah. sitting on the um, uh, on the couch, yeah. back and forth. Yeah, yeah, that, that was fantastic, and he was good too. He was really good. He, he could was. bring awesome. material into his conversation. So, I, so where did it all begin for you? Uh, as far as the comedy, the road to comedy. Wow. Yeah, that was it was kind of an interesting journey. Um, I, I was trained as a computer programmer at the University of Dayton and I was at AT and T doing pro oh, I'm sorry. The story bores me. You lost our entire audience as soon as you said. Oh my god. We all know that far back. Back. Get to the ones and zeros. Get to the ones and zeros. Those are the best part. So <laughs> So, so I was basically that guy. I was, I was the computer guy who was, I, I held court in my cubicle. There'd always be people like looking over my cubicle and, and I'd be, you know, making people laugh while I'm doing my work and then no one else is doing their work. And finally my boss said, what are you doing here? He's like, you do your job fine, but, but you don't seem to be happy here. And I wasn't. So I auditioned to get into MGM studios, which was opening in Orlando. And it was part of the, you know, the Disney theme park. So I was a host for them. I auditioned, um, and this is a, a interesting how I got the part. Uh, I I was taking an acting class at the time, just as extra, extra, extracurricular in Cincinnati when I was working at Cincinnati in, uh, at AT&T. And so uh, my mom called me up and she said, hey, I know you want to get out of there. Um, I just read that Disney is looking for comic actors. Maybe you cannot, you know, they're, they're, they're coming to Cleveland. So I called in sick from Cincinnati because back then they didn't have caller ID. They didn't have anything. So you could just, you can call in sick from anywhere. So I, I, um, I call in sick, drove up to, um, uh, in Cleveland and I auditioned for this, um, this role, uh, as a host, as a part of this MGM studios. And so my audition piece was, I, I they said, you mean in a 30 second monologue? So I was like, well, what happens in 30 seconds? Well, an elevator ride happens in 30 seconds. So I did the luxury elevator ride and I did, I, I, I played the um, old guy who did the control panel engineer. And then I was this the lounge singer. So I had a microphone in my back pocket that I spun around and then I began to sing like, when we get behind closed doors, all right, everybody, you know, and then, you know, the ride, <laughs> the ride was over. So then I, you know, but it was like the luxurious elevator ride in the, um, in the terminal tower in Cleveland. So I did that piece. They liked it. They called me back and, and I ended up getting that part. And so um, I did that for a year and then I did Universal Studios. I, I ended up shifting over to there that next year. I, I did a year at Universal. Yeah, right. Yeah. Back so when they had Amity. Remember Amity? The job? Right. Yeah. And they had, a, they had a lot of those old shows. That, that And I was in, called the fire department. And we had to learn all the different shows so that we could, if, if anyone called in sick, we were the ones that came in and did it. And so, uh, uh, which was fun because it, sometimes we weren't needed at all. So I'd be hung over and I'd be crashed. I, I don't know if you remember, do you remember the uh, the um, uh, Ghostbusters show? And they had, yes. well, they, and they had the big pads in front of it in case they fell, right? And they, uh, in case they fell off the stage, they had those big pads that you, you couldn't see from the audience. So we'd go in there and sleep on those. <laughs> wait till our buzzer went off to see if we had to go do a show. And then it turned out that those pads ended up having fleas on them. So we caught fleas from sleep. Oh, no. <laughs> so, so, you know, Dizzy and uh, Mickey Mouse was like, I'll show you. <laughs> Don't blow up my job. So then after that, I, I, um, I started doing stand up. I started taking a, yeah. work did you do Ricky, Vicky Rouseman's workshop? I, I knew Vicky Rouseman. Yeah. She used to come to the comedy corner in Tampa every now yeah, and then. Right. Yeah. yeah, she was she and she ran this workshop where she would let you do five minutes and then she would help you out. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So so I did that. And then if and then we, just we would, lost and, her last year. Yeah, we lost her. And um, yeah, um, they did a big ceremony for her. I didn't get a chance to go, but it looked like it was nice. They they, they sent her off in style. Yeah, um, was but Vicky had like she, she was like mother hen of all these comedians, yes. you know. Yes. And uh, yeah, so so she kind of got me started and we would I would do open mics and then we would uh, do these contests. And if you win the contest, you get to host the show at the professional level for free all week. But but you got to be on the real show. And, yeah. And then um, and so that's how it kind of started. Um, so um, from there, I just I, I quit my my day job, so to speak, and I started going on the road and I ended up in Chicago and I started training with Second City and then probably oh, okay. up there. And um, yeah, I got, I, I got trained by Del Close and Sharna Helpern and um, uh, Mick Napier and a lot of the big names up there in Chicago with, with the improv. And then I started touring for Second City while I was doing stand up. So I was trying to do juggle two careers at once. And then um, and then that's when I ended up getting the. Uh, what's that? As you do when you're in entertainment. 
You right, you have to. You gotta wear many hats and, and wigs. You gotta you gotta have I got about three or four different wigs that I wear as well. <laughs> Just shifting around. But then but then that's when I got the tonight show and that kind of broke me um into the headliner status. I, I began to um then you know have enough time and enough credits to be begin closing the shows and then I moved out to um, L.A. and and then um, um, right away I got a job with Second City in Vegas. And that's where I was um, in, in their main stage show at the Flamingo. And uh, I was I cast know, with um, Second City in Vegas. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. So I did. I, my roommate was uh, Jason Sudeikis. I don't know if you know that kid. Um, he's I don't know how he's doing now, but back then he was pretty funny. Um, who, who are some of your other uh, comrades in arms back at that time? Oh, yeah. Well, um, um, let's see. Um, so you're in Vegas. So were you hanging out with Carrot Top and Joey Viracola? Well, I knew Carrot Top. This Scott Thompson is his name. I, I knew Carrot yeah. Top actually from back when we were in Florida going in Vicky Rousman's. A funny story about Vicky. Uh, Vicky had us all together and she said, oh, hey, there's a kid coming in. He wants to show us his stuff. He's a prop act, so don't judge him too harsh. But <laughs> um, he's he's uh, he's young and he wants Which everybody did in the beginning. Of course. Of course. He's props. So, so in comes Carrot Top with this big floppy hair. And back then he was so skinny. He was like, uh, he reminded me of Sideshow Bob, you know, from, uh, <laughs> right? <laughs> like, a, like, a, like, a, like a mop with a, you know, on the, <laughs> in the handle. And, and he was that little and, and um, just one of the funniest guys I'd ever seen. He, he was so natural and he, he like, he had these props and he invented. And these weren't like, he didn't go to the Walmart and pick out things and say, isn't this funny off the shelf? He, he invented. No, no, he invented. Right. Yeah, he started solving problems. He was um, creating products. He was doing things that were there were punchlines. Joel Hodson used to do that too before he right. did Mystery Science Theater and um, uh, Gallagher. Gallagher, Gallagher great stuff. In yeah, fact, Gallagher was one of Scott, uh, you know, one of Carrot Top's heroes. You know, one of his heroes. Yeah, yeah. Because and he said, you know, I want to be the next that. So then Vicky saw him and he and did his whole act and he had us rolling. And you know how it is in an open mic uh, or, a, you know, a workshop. Like you can't get people to laugh. It's all people in the business. So they're right. like, oh, it was funny. Oh, interesting. And then we were rolling. <laughs> we were laughing. And so she, he gets done and he was like out of breath. He's holding like, you know, all this crap. And he's like, well, what do you think? And she was like, oh, my God, you're a real natural. You're really funny. She's like, personally, I would lose the props. Uh. I think you, you might have a shot. And so I always laughed at that. I always thought, like, like this is what I like about Scott, about Carrot Top, was he knew so well what who he was and what he wanted to do, and, and his dream was to be the prop guy. Right. But it didn't matter that someone said – someone like that, like like a, 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 an industry leader, so to speak, said, you know, hey, this is good advice. Lose the prop. He's like, no, no, this is what I do. No, that's me. So, yeah. <laughs> and, and, and that that sort of um, brings me to, like, what, what caused me to write the book that I wrote, the Finding Your Funny Muscle. Yes, it's a humor writing book, and um, part of what it does, what I like about this book, it, and there's a lot of humor writing books out there, or you know, supposedly um, books to tell you how to be funny. And w w the thing, the difference with this book is, I actually tell you how to do it. I give you the actual method on how to do it. And the reason why I figured it out, uh, a way to, to to explain that, is because of my own struggle when I hit the second Tonight Show that I did. The first Tonight Show went really well. I ended up piling in all my bits, all my best material into that. In my second Tonight Show, I didn't have much left. And so I was really trying to scrape together a second set. And, and it didn't go as well as, as the first one did. And I learned from that two things. I learned that I needed a comedy lens. I was lacking a comedy lens. I was lacking sort of that, um, that, that lens you look through at life, that sort of a twisted porthole that you look at life and, and it sort of gives you an angle on, on every topic from where you're coming from, from where your comedy comes from. And all the best right. have one, right? Like this could be you know, self-deprivational comedy. I mean, with me, it was voices. Right, yeah. So you're, you're the voice guy. You know, um, uh, Steve Martin is the wild and crazy guy. Richard Pryor is like the twisted or the yeah. um, like sort of the gritty city storyteller. Um, you got to find out what works best for you, right? Yeah. That's the first thing you got to do. And, 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 that's, and it seems like an easy thing to do. And I, I had tried to do that. I was like the tall, bald comedian. But that that was like, you, you could tell that by just me walking out there. Yeah. I, I needed to give them more because with a good comedy lens, what I found out, and, and I have one now, but the, but I didn't then. Uh, without that, the audience can't relate to you. The audience has no idea who you are, what you, where you're coming from. So then you become basically a, a corner quipper, you know, like the jokester, the, 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 the coffee maker that, that tells jokes and then you forget about them because it, it's not coming from anywhere. So that was the first thing I learned. The second thing I learned is I didn't know how to write jokes. I didn't know how to do you know, premise set a punchline and apply it to my takes. I just, I knew the theories of it, but I didn't know how it worked. 
So in my book, what I've done is I've taken a, I've created something I call a humor blueprint, and it uses a lot of about three or four different theories on how to create a laugh in order to um, to work, walk you through the, the steps it takes in order to make a laugh. I call it a, a flex. You know, you're funny. I say funny isn't a bone. It's not funny bone because bones are stiff and rigid. Humor is more like elastic and it stretches and it grows like a muscle. So, so that's the whole metaphor for this book is, is, is finding your funny muscle, figuring out how you can flex that laugh out. And the way you do that is you use this game plan, this humor um, blueprint, and you apply these heightening devices. There's 36, three dozen heightening devices that pro comics use. Things like um, callbacks, things like cut to, cut forward to, cut back to. Things like um, exaggeration, irony. There's 36 different ways to heighten what your ideas um, once you understand how to set them up. And what people don't understand a lot of times is a laugh is created when you misdirect people into a, thinking of a normal uh, scenario, and then you still satisfy that setup with a, something that's surprising. And if you don't have that setup and that um, that punchline, if you don't have that misdirection, and then a um, uh, it, it, it's um, uh, what do they call it a um, uh, your your uh, I, I can't remember the, the name, but, but people uh, um, you violate the norm, you, you benignly violate the norm. That's what I was trying to think of. Mm -hmm. That that's a, um, a, 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 a the norm is what what you set them up to expect, and then you benignly violate it. You give them like something of them satisfies it, right? Yeah, and and if you and if you can do that, it's it shocks them into a laugh, and that's your body's reaction to being pleasantly surprised that. So anyways, th this book does that. I, it's, it's a little bit convoluted the way I just said it. But basically, uh, I, I, I worked that out in, in a step by step process. It's funny and it's fun to learn. And, and, um, and it really gives you an insight on how to get that done. And they can get that at your website. Well, they can't get it until mid-April. The book comes out um, in mid-April. Oh, it was already out. It, it's not out yet. No, it's, it's right now. It's at the editor. It's, I, I, I've actually hired an editor. Um, a, a lot of times, um, I, I'm self-publishing this. I, I decided that I'm going to bypass. I'm going to be the prince, the the, for, the artist formerly known as Prince of uh, self-publishing. I'm going to, you know, how he sort of bypassed all the middlemen of the music industry. I want to do that with the publishing industry, because the way it's at right now is it's just really difficult to get a nonfiction book out on the out on the. Um, I, I, I can give you my publisher. <laughs> He's really <Yeah>. good. <laughs> I Paul did. Press. Lee, Lee, Lee is my is a good buddy of mine from high school, and he's published my books. And yeah, See, yeah. But you need that's the kind of thing you need that kind of inside scoop. But what I want to do is I, I've I've actually gone um, I've learned uh, how to do direct marketing and how to do uh, in, in one of my other jobs that I was doing while I was um, um, also being funny, and um, I'm I'm applying all the stuff I know into this this business. So, so basically I've, I've um, learned how to publish a book. And so the, the thing, the mistake that a lot of self publishers make is they think that because you're self publishing, you don't need to hire an editor. You don't need to hire a book designer, a cover designer. You don't have to hire an interior designer for your book. Right. And, um, and then it looks like crap. It looks like homemade. And so what I've done is I've hired all those people because if I do it, you know, yeah, like a stoner's problem. He does all that for me. <laughs> well, yeah, exactly. Well, that, and that's why you pay them money up front or they, they don't pay you as much up front and they have to take, get their money back. Yeah. Yeah. That's the, basically he gets his money back from the sales later. So okay. anyway, um, so we, we talked about some of the uh, carrot tops influences. Who are some of your influences? Oh boy. From the very beginning, Steve Martin was the, was the, yeah. best. I remember he would do those cons. I remember, I remember sitting, <laughs> sitting on the toilet, reading a time magazine, <laughs> seeing this guy on this white suit doing like this with a, with a um, arrow through the head and, um, maybe rabbit ears on or whatever. And I was just like, what is this? Who is this? And then I watched him on Saturday Night Live and, and saw some of his stand up. And, and then I saw him at concert and just, you know, he blew away the crowd and I just was in love. I was like, oh, that's what I want to do. I want to be, I want to be like intelligently silly, in, you know, like a, a goofball who, who, who makes funny points, you know? And so he started out in Disney on the street. Yeah, he was actually, he did their, um, there was a Wild West saloon show and he was the, the crazy entertainer that worked inside the saloon. Yeah, right. he was like a, like a street performer. And um, then, he, then he was a writer for um, some of those old, you know, comedy shows. That yeah, were, like Smothers Brothers and stuff like yeah, that. I think, yeah, he did the Smothers Brothers and <laughs> yeah, then he decided, he just, he's, he's like, I can, I can do this stand up stuff. But, and then eventually what he said was, um, we got, um, you know, stand up as a young man's game. He goes, it's just, it's too hard. And when he, when he was going to those theaters, it was, he was, he was, he said that it was a weird, like when he would, 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 
try to do is jokes, like to time a, a theater, like a, you know, six thousand people or ten thousand people of laughter. He said it was a, it was a, it was a mess because he hated it. Yeah, <laughs> he loved the clubs. <laughs> you, know, you can you can establish a, a know, rapport with your audience. Yeah, you, again, like that clip that we showed of you with the with the brick wall in the background. That that was every club back in the eighties. Right early 90s man it was the brick wall the microphone and the crowd was just like it was like you were in a room with your friends you know yeah you get to um you get to um just crack wise to people that were drinking and having a good time that was actually go bananas that club you saw there that's uh, that's right yeah i saw the the thing on the wall go bananas that was actually that club go bananas it used to be a funny bone that's in cincinnati and that's mm -hmm. where i was working at at t and that's actually where i did my very first comedy set like his first two comedy sets. I did, my friends talked me into going up on a Wednesday uh, um, and I did a five minute set. I, I wrote it out. I was throwing up and, you know, the runs all week, just so nervous about doing it. I did, it. I killed, I did really good. And so the um, MC came up afterwards. He goes, hey, we're having a contest next week. You should, you should enter, you know, um, and do five minutes for the contest. And, and I was like, oh, okay. So I didn't know how to do it. So I thought I, I wrote a whole new five minutes. I didn't know you were supposed to, you could just repeat your material. I didn't know that. Ah. <laughs> so I wrote a whole new five minutes and then I, um, I did it and it didn't go quite as good as the first week. Cause it was, you know, I was nervous and it was new stuff and I was, I got, it was so filthy and so like <laughs> just cheap. It was just awful, you know, but it was, you know, it was funny, but, but, um, but I didn't win. I didn't win. But the guy was like, Hey, you're really good. You should, you know, keep coming back. And I was like, no, this is too nerve wracking. And so oh. then I didn't do it again until I, I, until I got back down to Florida and I, I started taking Vicky's workshop. That was what gave me the confidence to sort of come out there. It's really, it's nerve. -wracking. If you've never done stand up, it's a very nerve wracking thing. If you don't know what you're doing, if you don't get the right advice in the beginning, yeah, it can be, it can be hell. Yeah. It's it a, really can. It's very it can be, vulnerable. It can murder it's, on you. Well, you're you're saying um, I'm 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 like in a room full of people where there's a lot of funny people. I'm funnier than all of you so much so that you have to pay me money to say things to you to get you to laugh because you can't do this yourself. That's what I'm telling you when I stand up on this stage. So if you can't back that up, it, that's hard. You know, like there you like, go. Like you said, if you don't know how you what you're doing, or if you don't have a plan, which is again what why the comedy lens, having a real clear comedy lens, is so important. Because if you don't have that, if you're if you're not coming from a place, number one, you don't know what to talk about. You could talk about everything. I could I go, I could look at my desk, go, well, why are lamps funny? Why is a glass of water funny? What's the microphone funny? A chessboard? I don't know what's funny. And you just you could go all around because and what's, just, what's with this thermostat? Right. I'm yeah. Fine. Right. And he, but even Seinfeld, like like he was he was <laughs> things that were were unimportant and making them important, things that were irrelevant and making them relevant. So like that was a lens. And so at least he had something to go. For. So he could go around and go, you know, what's the deal with the lamp? And he could actually do his material because he, that was his comedy lens. With mine, I was just lost. And so now my comedy lens, I found out I'm I'm the clumsy Aspie hole. <laughs> so let me I'll explain it real quickly. Um, I don't I, um, I found out sort of through some um, Google research and some some stoner uh, um, psychotherapy that I'm, I'm somewhat on the autism spectrum. I'm on, on the functional end where, where they call it Asperger's. And they don't really call it that anymore, but that's sort of like the nickname they gave it. So I think that the, the, the cute nickname is going to be an Asper. So, so um, examples of Aspies are like uh, Sheldon Cooper, um, Dwight um, yeah. Schrute. So these are they're, they're they're more like what we call an Aspie hole, which is somebody who's sort of oblivious to the fact that they're not very good socially. Sometimes they're not very yeah. um, hip to emotions like like we're dealing with a five pack, of, a five crayon pack of emotions where everyone else has 64 packs. And so we're like very limited on how we're, you know, on, on our empathy, even like we'll, we'll, we'll tell you the truth about something. And we can't believe your feelings are hurt because it's true. Like, why, like why, why are you mad at me? I, I just told you what's true. So that's what an Aspie hole is. So an Aspie hole um, quite often um, has expectations of the world. Like we, we really want the world to be a certain way because we do it a certain way and we're very conscious of it. And so we expect it the way that way. What we're unaware of is all the ways we fall short because we don't notice those things. And so the, the thing I add to that is I'm clumsy. I'm, I, I'm physically clumsy. I'm, I don't, I've always been. I'm, I'm, when I was played softball, I, I accidentally threw the ball to the umpire instead of the catcher because I, I was aiming wrong. And, you know, I, I have no ligaments in my right ankle, so I'm constantly falling. And ankle, I, I, I've gotten taken down by an acorn. 
And so, um, so I'm clumsy. So I can't measure up to the perfection I set the world up to be. So I'm constantly doing things like, like the other day, um, I, we, I went to my daughter's, um, uh, first, she's she's an actress at her uh, middle school theater. So I went to her show, and so I was, you know, very adamant. She was like, you know, don't embarrass me. Of course not. We're not going to embarrass you. So ah. my my wife and me were we're in the front row. We're, Man, we're so and, uncool, right? <laughs> of course. I'm <laughs> like, oh, so embarrassing. I know. I like, no, we won't we... embarrass. You, I promise. I go. I, I'm I'm a performer. I get this. So I was telling my my wife and my son, like, shut your, make sure your phone is shut off. And then this was a, it was a, a, a um sort of a, a box office theater like uh, what do they call those like where, where, um, black box a black box theater so so yeah. so there are tables instead of chairs so we're all sitting around tables and they're it, it's at, happening at a cafe so we're being served water so i'm talking to my 10 year old son be careful with that water don't spill it we're not embarrassing her so then <laughs> cut to my daughter's in the middle of her one of her monologues and my phone goes off no. my, then i'd set on buzz I don't know how it did, but alarm I'd set. So now I can't get it out of my pocket. So I'm like doing this and I'm I'm doing it. And everyone's like, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. And so the whole play stopped. I finally get it out and I, I hit the thing and I was like, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. You know, and I wanted to just like yell like, it's not my fault. The phone is, the, there was a flaw in the, in the design of the phone. You know, I want to blame the, the phone company, not the fact that I didn't I didn't just shut the phone off instead of it. You didn't so do what I didn't know what I was to do. <laughs> In that mess, I, like I didn't know what, what that I had I had done more damage because five minutes later I look over and I see my wife fussing with her purse. I'm like, oh my god, what is she doing? Is she going to embarrass us now? And I realize she, her purse is filled with water. Why is your purse filled with water? I look up. I had knocked over my water, and it had poured into her purse oh, on the table. Oh. So the clumsy Aspie hole, who was so adamant about everyone not embarrassing him, did, did all of it. I did everything. So that's an example of of, of my comedy lens. Worst night ever. Oh, <laughs> it's so perfect. It's like I don't know. Is that irony? Would you call that irony? It's a like <laughs> irony where you do the there, thing. There's definitely some irony there. Yeah. Right? Yeah. More people are like, don't you do this? I'm gonna do it. I don't be the one who's close. <laughs> oh. oh man. She was, she was cool about it. She was nice about it. She laughed. My daughter. I mean. I mean, she has to. Afterwards, yeah. Afterwards, yeah. <laughs> you gotta pay her off. Sorry, Lori. <laughs> there you go. Uh, but you know what? When she gets to be older, she's going to look back at those times and she's going to go, you know, he was a really fun dad. That's that's what I tell her. That's a, that's the exact speech I give her. Listen, you got to understand someday. You're oh, gonna... No, no, don't tell him that. Just let it happen on its own. <laughs> oh, oh, you're not supposed to tell him. I'm going to be dead soon. And when I'm dead, oh, you'll regret it. You'll remember this. No. That's not how you do it. See, no. comes the ass people. <laughs> <laughs> what you know, you came up with a question. What's that? Renee just came up a minute ago. I thought maybe she had a question for you. I have a lot of questions, but I'll I'm, keep oh, going. That was, that was a good story. I will, never, story. I will never stop talking if you don't ask me a question. <laughs> I'm, a, I'm a robo. I'm a robo uh, talker. Um, well, I have a oh, okay. All right, no, I have a million questions. Uh, number one, I wanted to ask you a little bit about the projection of your career. Like right now, you're you're segueing into being an author, right? And of course, the book is about humor, so it's still a continuation of your comedy career. But where would you like your trajectory trajectory to go? You know, do you want to have a podcast? Do you want to keep writing books? Do you want to do maybe a fiction book, maybe a humorous fiction book? What do you have in your arsenal of tools that you want to be using as you go forward? The easiest answer would be to say yes. Yes, to everything. <laughs> Open horizons and vistas, right? No, that's a very good question because it's it's um you're you're pegged exactly where I'm at and and, and the choice I've been having to make because either I have to to choose to go back on the road and be a comedian and deliver right. jokes again, and I don't want to do that. I, I'm I have I still have a you know 13 year old and a 10 year old kid kids and and I, I want to help co raise them and be there for them. And what I realize and and Rory, you know, like as a comedian, you're just out of town all the time and you have to be and you have right. Fifty two weeks a year willingly. <laughs> and, and it has to be. You have to like love it. You have to love being on the road and, and going to those places. And I don't anymore. I really as, just as we get older. No, <laughs> really don't. that's why Steve Martin said it's a young man's game because like well, you know, and, and again, I'll, I'll live in my car for the week. Change too. Yeah. Yeah. They, don't, they don't give you all the perks that we used to get when we were younger. You know, the free drinks, the nice hotel rooms. What? What? They 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 they, they, they make kids pay. <laughs> I've probably mentioned this on about 50 of our shows. They make kids pay to do open mic night now. I mean, what? I, I got, what? 
And they used to have a bringer where they would they would make you bring people in it. Like I was like, oh my God, nobody wants like all my I've burnt all my friends out on my material. No one's gonna do it. <laughs> but but Renee, in answer to your question in terms of a uh, direction now, uh funnymuscle.com is my uh website. And at funnymuscle.com, I've begun to create material uh content as a writer and as a performer. Uh, that I deliver for free on that um, site mm -hmm. in order to bring traffic to sell my books. And I'm going to be teaching classes based on the books. I, this is a three book series. It's finding your funny muscle teaches the concepts. Uh, fine tuning your funny muscle is the second book. And that takes these um, the humor heightening devices and the comedy lens uh, um, hunt into a deeper level. And then the third book is flexing your funny muscles. And that's how to use these concepts in the real world, either as a comedian or as a, like say you're a speaker or maybe you just want to talk to your crush and you want to make them laugh. And, you know, but this the third book will sort of cover that part. Right. So do, be a teacher of comedy. Do the workshops. Go that, cut deals right. with clubs to get their open micers uh, in your workshops. That would be great. That's, right? that's kind of what, that's kind of where I want to get to be now. And then so so my content, um, what I've been doing on the um, on the website, it's been fun. I, 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 I got a couple of different things, ways I've been going about it. One one thing I've been doing is I, I, I'm a writer now, so I do a lot of written stuff. But I also know that it's a bummer to have to read like long walls of text. So I also do audio versions of all my stuff. So I perform my stuff and then you can hit play and listen and read along or you can go, you know, multitask and do other things while you're listening to it. So in a, in a sense, it's a, a bit of a podcast. Right. The other thing I do on there is I do the videos. And so what I've come to realize, my, my the name of my CD it's, um, that I used to sell was called Mike Lucas, A Fun Bunch of Guys. And I realized that that's kind of what I am as a fun bunch of guys. I like to create different characters. And then I like to talk to the – like like how I, I was talking to my bed. That was two characters talking right. to me. So right. I'm creating these videos where that is happening. So like one video I did, I, I just did me um, showing a, a guy who came to uh, – warn us that we needed to trim our dead branches that were hanging over a neighbor's thing. But he was like so polite and so hesitant to do his job that he just went uh, for like 10, 15 minutes of why it, it was okay that this was happening. <laughs> so I, I did me talking about him and then I played him. So I have that video. I have some clumsy Aspie hole stories that I tell, which is the, um, there, <laughs> my, my wife was telling me about a, a documentary about an English boy who was a 10 year old, basically Aspie hole. And they, they filmed him in his class talking to his friends and then they filmed him afterwards. And in the class talking to his friends, he's monopolizing the conversation. He's talking about himself. He's telling about how great his coding is, how great his grades are, how wonderful he is. Afterwards they ask him, well, how did it go? You know, how did the, he was like, it was great. It was, these guys, great lads, great lads, fun stuff. These, uh, we had a great meeting. Can't wait to do it again. Yes, the other kids were like, what? That kid was a jerk. We couldn't stand it. That was horrible. He hogged the whole conversation. So I created this series of videos where it's the clumsy Aspie hole describing something that happened. And then we have another character explaining how it really went down from the other from the world's point of view. So I call it Tales of the Clumsy Aspie Hole. And the first one is I is me going to the grocery store. And then we hear what it really went like. And then the second one is a pharmacy call, a, car to, a call to the pharmacy to re-up my prescription. And the third one is a drive to the doctor's office. And so so, so the, there's different content like that on the website. And I'm using that to sort of bring traffic to that and then calling attention to the book. Awesome. And probably a podcast, too. Probably. But not, not to compete with this one. I'll probably do it like right after this one at 6 o'clock. <laughs> so 7 o'clock Monday. Oh, 7 o'clock. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Oh shoot! See, already, already, I'm competing. I didn't mean that. <laughs> no, but the podcasts are difficult because you're really trying to, you know, it, it, it's doing one podcast is easy. Doing podcasts every week, as you know, it can be a grind if you don't, if you're not really into it and you don't have a real. Yeah, podcast. well, yeah. Again, the, the trickiest part is getting good guests on the show weekly. You know, on a on a, reg on a regular basis. So, you know, I send out dozens, uh, if not hundreds of, you know, invites to people. Yeah. Um, and sometimes we get lucky, you know, and John Biner will call us back going, Hey, I just wrote a book or. Right. You know, yeah. Uh, what, what just, helped he just wrote me back from Hawaii. He's. Oh, like, really? Yeah. So we're oh, on May 2nd. So again, it's, 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 you just shoot, shoot stuff out there and hope that something comes yes. back. <laughs> yeah. I, I appreciated the $5,000 that to me, that, that was one of the main reasons I came on the show. Cause I needed the money. Uh, you, you sent the check, it cleared. <laughs> uh, I mean, the, the 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 $5,000 pay there or something like that. Is that true? 
It's funny you should say that. <laughs> we we asked a comic. Some of my my viewers know who it is. We asked a comic that I used to work with uh, to come on the show, and uh, yeah, he wanted four thousand dollars. I was like, oh, it doesn't work that way. I'm sorry. <laughs> and he goes, well, how much can you pay me? <laughs> we have that budget. We have that budget for sure. Right. So I was like, no, you know, everybody kind of comes on, you know, we're, you know, with this like little thing and uh, people come on and we have a good time. That's the important thing is we, t we, we took, we be real, we talk real and we, we have a good time. So. Yeah, we're trying to, and, and, and it helps us because we're trying to, you know, if we're trying to pitch something or we're trying to sell some shows or whatever. Why not? I just, I just noticed my background. Have you, I, I Googled, uh, this is a, this is an electronic background. This isn't my real house. This is, I, I Googled. Um, <laughs> Um, trashy office and then I got this picture and I just now I, I just green screen it back there because I didn't want to I what you don't want to do is intimidate people with what it really looks like which is exquisite it's lovely and so I just said I said it's ugly green, ugly green. I, I think Renee's got that one <laughs> Renee, you got that one I, I got that one I <laughs> yeah, well, you, she has this one. Yeah, with uh, I, I put a slender creepy bookcase I said um brown <laughs> curtains I said, get, get it, give me the whole look. Give me everything if you can. And then uh, uh, African Are violet. Those predator violet action violet figures. <laughs> and this is one of those 3D ones that you can touch. It's, 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 you can touch. I, I know it looks like I'm really touching it, but this is all electronic. It's all electronic. <laughs> so, so I got to ask you. I mean, I mean, I know, I know everything went swimmingly with Jay Leno, uh, uh, but you also went Conan, Conan O'Brien. Yep. Uh, how did that go? That, that was good. The, the, the bummer about Conan was um, they they saw me at the Montreal Comedy Festival, and I had done the set that I did on Leno on the um, Tonight Show, um, and they it, it, for the Montreal Comedy Festival, and, uh -huh. and so all that kind of tied it together. And so the the Booker from the Conan Show wanted me to do the same set. And I'd already done it on the Tonight Show, and I was like, "Oh, I kind of don't want to do the same set." And they were like, "Yeah, we kind of want you to do that one." So I did that one, and it went good. The 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 um, the, the thing, the bummer about the Conan set was the um, the opening line I had is the line that kills in the clubs, and I just I threw it in there just to do it because I felt like it was a good thing to do in that moment, and it did. It it, it kind of sat there because it needs a second, and I needed to keep moving. And so it kind of sat there. So it was like laying a turd at first and then having to like grab the thing back and, and grab Oh, the man. So, so it was- Did they say anything about that after? What's that? Did they say anything about that after? Like, uh, no, the only one that said something about that was the, the guy who was managing me at the time. He was like, uh -huh. no, I can't use that. I can't use that because that's the opening thing. And I was like, oh, man, I didn't think about that. It usually <laughs> kills. But I, I was, um, I, the, the line is, um, um, what was it? It was about, um, oh, about- being bald and i said something about the only thing something um about missing eye contact like something about how you know and then i did people like oh i said if i could never wear a wig i could never wear fake hair because if you wear fake hair you'd have to um uh, constantly deal with um it's something about the eye contact see i can't even do the bit now but but <laughs> but basically about how people like hey mike how's it going what's going on with you you know uh, you know and they're, they're, they're staring at your wig the whole time yet you know and so um so the joke the, the joke normally kills when you go in a club and you start start that out and then i did that on there and, and like it is now like you're like oh wait what <laughs> <laughs> yep exactly yep. Yep. Um, we had a couple of questions just to clarify the website again because the yep. fans are trying to get to the website yeah funnymuscle.com 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 and then um one of our viewers wants to know if you're in screen actors guild yeah uh, you know what? i never joined screen actors guild no i um i was a um what's the other after i was an after member because i did a lot of stuff on um for second city and the radio on the theater and um but but i never was sad you got to um like it's it's a weird thing you have to almost like you have to get work to qualify to be in SAG, but to get SAG work, you have to be in SAG to get it. So mm -hmm. it's really yeah. difficult to get that first thing. And I never, um, I never got that first thing to, to get, to get the SAG invite. And then and it well, is on my, uh, when I went and checked, uh, checked you out on IMDB, um, straight, straight dope club dead. Straight, oh, that's great. Club dead. What was club dead? Oh, I remember what club dead was. Club dead was a video game. Oh, it was a video game. All right. Oh, that was a video game. What That's was, cool. Oh, that was very cool. Yeah. I, I did a couple of pretty cool things in Chicago. That that video game was one of them. 
Um, I did a Liz Fair video, that video Jealousy. I played the bartender. When you go to the video, the Liz Fair video Jealousy, if you turn it on right now, you can see me. I'm, I'm the guy in the front shaking the thing. And then the, the straight dope um, is a, it's a, um, a, a news column. And it's uh, Cecil Adams is the guy who is the pseudonym of the guy who, who writes this. And um, it's a sort of a, a twisted question and answer, like a sarcastic, snarky, you know, question and answer um, column that's in the Chicago Reader, which is like a free weekly that they give okay. away that shows you where all the bands are playing, where um, where, where the different theater uh, outlets are, are showing that week. And, and then they have this Cecil Adams um, straight dope. And so um, this guy wanted this Andy Rosen is the guy who, who um, ended up um, uh, producing the show and he wanted he would wanted to bring it to TV so so he was looking for long-haired uh, smoking uh, host and then I showed up allergic to nicotine with no hair and um, sort of went over so then uh, did I you say allergic to nicotine yeah really yeah, I throw up if I if I if I oh smoke cigarettes or chew tobacco or have a cigar. I think that's the like, first time I've ever met anybody. That's who was a good thing. That's a really good yeah, thing. Well, I tried as long as I could be yeah, addicted to, to nicotine, and I couldn't do it because I would just keep throwing up. It was like yeah. you know when you get car sick and you feel that sort of yeah, nausea. Yeah, get nauseous. And you yeah, nauseous. it's not even a fun nausea like second when you're drunk. Smoke? With, no, secondhand smoke doesn't really do it for you. You're okay. Yeah, but it's just yeah. it, the second I inhale it, so. Um, which is a good thing, like like you're saying, Renee. It, it's, it's yeah, like, it's actually a really yeah. good thing. Um, we have a question about um, what you think about Rich Hall and Lee Mack. Rich Hall, I know Rich. Rich Hall is great. Rich Hall was um, like he's he's what I like about comics like Rich Hall is like he has a real he has a real clear comedy lens. He's kind of like a dark twisted guy, and um, but he was always what did, what did he do? He had like that a gimmick he did for a while. Um, what was Sniglets. 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 Like that was great because then he he could launch off of that and he could use that as the base of his act and then he could do other stuff off of that. And I always thought that he was a really good writer and a really um, good. His, yeah, his most brilliant bit to me, I, I, and my viewers can look it up on on YouTube. It's on YouTube. Just just type in Rich Hall and Tom Cruise, where he's talking about Tom Cruise. Oh, nice! And how easy it is to write a Tom Cruise movie. <laughs> <laughs> I look up who Lee Mack is. I don't know. And it just Mack. goes on and on and on, and it just gets funnier as it goes on. Yeah. You know. Well, well, um, the thing about him, Rich Rich Hall, is is from that um, sort of that that um, improvisation world where he yeah. knows how to height the yes and and heighten. So no matter what what you start off with, you just begin to pile on it, and it becomes bigger and bigger and weirder and weirder. And he was very good at that, and he was very good at uh, doing it with a straight face. You know? Well. I don't know if you remember the show Fridays. Oh yeah, it was oh, on, yeah. Uh, that's where Michael Richards got his start. Do you remember? Yeah, Michael Michael Richards was there, and Melanie uh, Chartoff was on that Melanie show. Chartoff, uh, 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 oh, Mark so. Blankfield, yeah, Mark um, Daryl Igish, uh, and, and uh, Curb Your Enthusiasm. Oh yes, yes, yeah. That was that was a great show. I remember Michael Richards used to play with the Army Men, and he would be. I can't, on, believe, I can't uh, remember this guy's name. Um. um but uh, Rich Hall is the only guy to ha to be on that show and a season of Saturday Night Live. They they actually kind of stole him away from them, or or I think the the show yes. went under after a couple of seasons. Yeah, and then he ended up on Saturday Night Live after I for like a season. What, that's isn't that interesting because that's they, they were they were mad at each other. I think from what I remember, like because they were doing well because they were trying to steal their thunder. You know, they were yeah. Yeah, well, Saturday Night Live took a, a night that was normally dead, and they grabbed it for their own, and and then yeah. Friday was trying to do that too. But yeah, I love I like that show. I, I remember they had who was the guy that did? Uh, it was Michael Richards. He would do the pharmacist yeah. where he was he was addicted to his own medicine, and so he was he was, <laughs> he was trying to get the job done while he was just totally hammered. He used to do some fun. Richards stuff. did some great bits on that well, show. Blank, Blankfield, the physical comedy that he and Blankfield did on that show were just unbelievable. Remember the, the raw chickens? They, they, he did the whole raw chicken thing where he was he would do like... That was, would, was that Bruce Mahler? I think so. Bruce I, I, Mahler, they did it, and he ended up in the Police Academy movies. Yes, yes, that's right. Yeah, God, good memory. Good one. Yeah. <laughs> 
Yeah, but I didn't know the other guy you talked about, Lee Mack. I didn't know. I don't know him. But it's so hard to find episodes of that today. I I, I, I have time to find. You know, I saw uh, Melanie Chartoff on um, Twitter, mm -hmm. and I was like, oh hey, I said hi to her, and I just was like, like, um, holy crap, I I love you. You're great. You were wonderful in that show. What you know? What? How can I watch that show again? And she was like, uh. I, I know it's like locked up in a vault or something. It's very right. hard to find. I wonder if there's like a story about that, like where they they purposely locked it up to. I don't, some reason. Know. I don't know. I just know it's very hard to find it anywhere. Yeah. Uh, uh, I I think you can find certain sketches, like the the Rocky Horror Picture Show thing that they did with Ronald Reagan with Mike Michael is it Michael O'Rourke that was doing Ronald Reagan as Greg Herder. Oh my gosh. <laughs> I think you can still find that on there. And uh, yeah, and Chardoff was doing the news, right? The with news, Hall. Yeah, she was one of the news Hall. talking heads. Yeah. God, that was a good show. Yeah. So, yeah. Wonderful show. Yeah. Wonderful show. And again, like you say, so much talent there with, you know, like you say, Michael Richards. And I, I can't believe I can't remember. Come on, Renee, help me out here. You watch Curb Your Enthusiasm all the time. I, I love Curb Your Enthusiasm. I absolutely love Who's it. Who's the star of Curb Your Enthusiasm? He was very young when he was on Friday. Larry David? Larry David. Larry oh, David. I, yeah, I, I thought you were talking I, about someone else. Good. Good. Not everybody knows Larry David. Oh, so simple. And he's doing a Bernie <laughs> Sanders. <laughs> Larry David. He played, and it's cool because when Bernie Sanders was running for president, you know, uh, Larry David was going on Saturday Night Live and everywhere because everyone said Larry David and Bernie Sanders are like the same person. So he would just go on Saturday Night Live and 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 just basically do himself, and it was Bernie Sanders. And then they did a they did a sketch with both of them together, and they're they're the same person. You can't tell the difference. <laughs> he does a great Bernie Sanders. Bernie Sanders does a great Larry David. Yeah, they both do a great one of each other. Yeah. <laughs> to begin to replace each other in order to like sort of get a relief from their own life. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> I love Kirby and these. I mean, we had um, Ray Buffer on who played a stage manager in one of the episodes um, in the producers season of that. And uh, I just love everybody. Susie Essman on there, uh, who's a good friend of Eddie Brills, who comes on these shows as well, too. But um, I oh, was born I in on that show. Uh, Cheryl Hines is one of the big. Uh, she she <laughs> is. I always her? said this. I always said this. She, to me, was the star of that. I know she came back even after the divorce or whatever, but. She, to me, made Larry, her straight woman performance and the way that she sort of nurtured that character, right. to me, always made it so much better. Like, there but for her, I feel like it, it, it really was atrophying a little bit when she wasn't there, which is why I was glad that they brought her back. She right. is phenomenal and so convincing I, I and so funny. Exactly the same way about Rhea Seahorn on uh, Better Call Saul. Yeah. She right. She made that show for yeah. me. You need yeah. you need someone who's grounded in order to yeah. let the crazy guy be crazy and have it still make sense. And if you don't have that grounded part, and that's what Cheryl was great at, and she right. was able to make like his weirdness realistic because she exactly. took it seriously and she she bought into it. It was such a realistic dynamic, and it's a lot of it's it, her role was really a lot of okay, okay, could we not? Could we not? And it's <laughs> like he's a child, almost like he's a child. Right. Yeah, I know her from, we worked together down in Orlando when I was doing that um, Universal Studios show uh, mm -hmm. as the fire department where we were playing all the different roles. Um, we, I say we, as if there's someone in my pocket. Um, it was me. It was just me. And um, she was uh, she was in the Psycho show. Um, if you remember the movie Psycho, yeah, there's a, yeah. Um, a scene where there's a, a, um, a Janet Leigh was in the um, shower and she's getting stabbed. Well, there's the Hitchcock a Hitchcock show, yeah, the Hitchcock show, right? And so, uh, what was I saying? The Psycho. Oh yeah, yeah, but yeah, and it was yeah. in the movie Psycho, but it was the Hitch Hitchcock show. And then the Psycho scene, she played. She would wear a full, um, like a nude body um, tights or whatever, but but yeah, the suit. And then she would be behind like a um, a shower that looked sort of um, foggy. So it looked like she was naked, standing there taking a shower, and then she would be killed like like seven to eight times a day. <laughs> stabbed, and that was her job. That was her job was to be that you know person. How did you do today? Killed the show. Eight, eight times today. <laughs> what, is, what is Cheryl like as a person? I always wanted to know that because she's a J. She's she's 
um, you know, acquaintance or colleague adjacent to me, but I've never met her. And everything that I've heard through that social grapevine is that in real life, she also is very grounded and very organized and methodical as a person that she's, she's very dependable. And, and that was that your experience with her as well? No, she is an evil, you know, <laughs> she, she, oddly, when I started, a maniacal, horrible person. That's what I would have thought to yeah. Trying to plot your death while she's yeah. smiling the whole time. She comes Her, across that way, definitely. Really, yeah. Oddly, like when I saw her on uh, Curb, I, I was like, oh my God, that is like the perfect role for her. Like she is, just has to be herself. Like that is who she is. Right. She's funny. She's silly. She's nice. She's, um, normal she's as normal as an artist gets right she, she's she's does she's not full of herself um she, right. in fact, when we were doing uh, my wife and i did a show out in los angeles called cracking up and it was a, on cbs radio it was a, a show where we took um we made the the weird news come alive so we would look for weird um it would be we, um, once a week we did it two it, it was on friday night which is 11 o'clock on friday p.m. and then it would go to 1 a.m. on Saturday morning so we called it Friday night mm -hmm. and then it was um, we, we called it cracking up with Gretchen and the Lukes and we made the weird news come alive so we would find the weirdest news stories and then we would have our improv and comedy friends play the parts of them as if they were the real like as if we like scored this interview with the guy from the the, 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 the squirrel collector from from you know Peoria is on our show and we're talking to him but it would be Rich Tellerico who's you know one of our friends Right. So Daryl came in. In fact, I have this on my website. If you want to go check it out uh, on the funnymuscle.com website, there's a that we I put one of the episodes up of cracking up, and it's with Cheryl plays a woman. There, there, it, it, I forget what city was happening in, but they had a happy hour. It was a very big happy hour, and someone sued them saying it was sexist because women drank for free. And so they closed down and shut down the happy hour. And so Cheryl came on playing a woman, um, who, and then Tammy, who made a living off happy hours. So her whole existence was getting free drinks and food and, and hooking them up with guys through these happy hours. And this really set her back. This this whole like news story like ruined her life. And so she's on our show talking about like, you know, you gotta understand, you know. I've gotta like, see that. Like, I've gotta I'm see that. I'm gonna make a living doing, you know. Like, that's so funny. And she plays it so perfectly because, you know, she's like, I'm sitting there having my Nescafe. <laughs> yeah. so, but she plays, you know, she's playing like the Southern, like, um, like, you know, cool. And, and, but she's, but she's, you know, obviously got it going on, you know, because. She's oh, I just love that. And I love, I've always respected her career because, you know, a lot of artists tend to be really on the crazy or the undependable side. And she's somebody that I always heard that about, that she was just so dependable and, you know, um, right as rain. And I love that because it, she's proof that you don't have to always be a crazy eccentric to make it in Hollywood. You can have that really strong um, left brain going like she does. Um, yeah, I think that's really true. And I think with her, it just it's shocking when you talk to her. She's very just normal and that's that's kind of nice because hollywood ruins a few people right you, but we never see her we never see the the cheryl hines uh tmz headline <laughs> so she know. made it she really did make it off of her grace and talent and her connections and stuff like that and when i say connections i mean being a good performer and a good friend and a good colleague that's what i mean but she really made it that the the good way, you know, the way that you want to believe you can make it instead of just always acting out or having something totally insane going on in your life. And I, and I love that. And I respect that. And that's really inspiring to me, especially as a woman, that's inspiring to me. Sure. You, don't have to, you don't have to really color outside the lines in a negative way. You can be funny and you can push those boundaries creatively, but you don't have to have your personal life in total ruins all the time. So I love that. Yeah, she she came out of the groundlings, I believe, out in L.A. She she mm -hmm. went up going from Florida out to L.A. and began to do that groundlings uh, scene, which is sort of like Second City. Right. Like, yeah, she has street cred. Yeah, yeah, she has street so, cred. Yeah, she, and then she became like this, like a really incredible yes ander. She's a real great heightener. She's a real somebody who um, she's a great listener. Like so, when we were in our scene, when we were doing our our radio thing, she listens to the details that's being that are being laid out, and then she uses them like a palette. And then she just right. begins to lay them on. And then mm -hmm. at first, it's not necessarily funny, but then when you begin to collect them and then begin to call them back and begin to have them as be that, that becomes your personality, it, it, that's when it becomes funny because you, you realize that there's a game afoot. 
Right. Yeah. She's yeah. great at that, 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 that kind of comedy game. Right. And I so res respect Second City. I so respect Groundlings. Um, all of them. Saturday Night Live, of course. Just any of these. They're incubators. They're creative and humorous incubators, which allows performers to really find their footing and to work collaboratively because I think a lot of create creativity happens in that lab when you get to work with other performers you find something within yourself that blossoms and flowers out that you didn't find just alone in a room particularly with with humor you know with me I might think something is hilarious privately but you you know nobody else finds it funny it's an inside joke with myself you know but once you're working with other people they can refine it and hone in on what's truly funny to an audience as opposed to just me chuckling with myself yeah. you know so I, I really respect performers that come out like that such as yourself there's like a synergy to it that, that yeah. you know yeah that's what i found like that that i've always it's funny when i was in college i was management information system was my major which is Basically, you're the in between the technical people and the business people, and then you have to speak both languages, and you have to sort of be bilingual and talk to both. You know, right. and you can't talk down to the one group, you know group, and you can't you know like be talked down to by the other group. So you have right. to really find a balance between those things. And so mm -hmm. when I became in the middle of stand up and and, and Second City and, and Improv Olympic, it was like my MIS skills came in because I had to be like, okay, there's stand-up comedy is a certain art form and like you said the synergy of, of the group work was another sure. thing yeah. and the real mistake that comics make when they go into the group thing is they try to be funny mm -hmm. they're really trying to make jokes and they're trying to be funny and, and what that does is steal the the um it steals the attention and like, say, focus. Say, yeah yeah and when you're say Good if focus. you're in a scene it, it's it's like a, a metaphor would be a, a, a balloon that you're all keeping up you know, by blowing in the middle of your of, of the mm -hmm. group, and each one of you blows a certain amount, and it keeps it right here. A, a comic comes in and goes boom and grabs the ball and goes ha ha, bah, 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 I'm doing an eye, I'm doing it, blah, 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 and then and then throws the thing away, and they're like, okay, but there goes our scene. Yeah. So you have to learn as a comedian when you walk into this group how to be part of the blowing the balloon in the middle. And right. Having and, you got to you know, be part of the ensemble. Yeah. 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 It's like a team sport. It's exactly like a team sport. You can't try to, that's why I always felt like uh, true comics and true performers to me aren't really arrogant people. They know how to toss the ball. And I've given Rory this, this compliment before that he always knows how to toss the ball yeah. to be a great performer. You're not hogging the limelight all the time. Cause you understand that a good performance, you might have a weakness that one of your colleagues can come in and fill. And that's what makes great performance. That's how you get, you know, that's the rising tide lifting all ships that you, other people can make you look good yeah. when you step back a little bit. Yeah. And so it, I learned that, uh, it, especially when, when we were working at second city in, uh, in Vegas, uh, I was working with some really talented people there and the, the, uh, the shows that we did, like we couldn't have done it alone. Like the, like the, the, right. the things yeah. that came out of that was because I was listening and they were listening and we took those ideas and we just heightened and heightened and heightened. And mm -hmm. uh, I'll give you one example. Um, Jason uh, and I were roommates. And when we first got there, he noticed at the Meridian, which is the hotel, or the it's kind of like a um, set of apartments. Uh oh. Condos kind of. And so he noticed that they would put up these notices. They're really sort of blase notices like you know uh, on tuesday there's a chess tournament uh you know meridian own it uh meridian residence only uh, on thursday we're going to be doing a finance uh you know a retirement um uh, uh talk so come on by and, and learn how to save your money so stuff like that so he was like oh my god the, the language they use on this makes me laugh so hard so he started writing his own and he'd start posting them and he would like he would go to kinko's and get them done exactly how they did theirs include like everything except for like the the content and then he would post them within the the ones that they would post up to so, so that at first you wouldn't even know that they're different but it'd be stuff like like you put up stuff like um um tuesday um make sure you clear all your cars out from the garage because we're going to do a drifting workshop um Buff, buff up on your stunt driving. Um, resident seventy plus older only. You know, you know. And then uh, <laughs> what I remember he did was, um, um, uh, how's your basketball game? Or, 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 or think you can take on an NBA star? Um, former NBA legend. Um, uh, who, I don't remember he, who chose. Um, uh, Michael right Jordan will, 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 is going to be making an appearance at the Meridian Basketball Court to take on all comers. <laughs> Meridian residents only. So you just do stuff like that. Over. 
finally the point he did it so often that the, they called our stage manager and said, hey, could you, whoever's doing that, could you tell them to stop? We, we, it's, it's confusing our residents. <laughs> but he did it for weeks. I mean, literally for weeks. That's, that's, you know, that's like taking a game and heightening it to the extent of, of annoyance. That's hilarious. We have, um, by the way, I want to say that we have comments of, of people saying this is their favorite episode ever of It's Casual. Ah. Want to go out and buy your book. Um, and I hate yeah. to do this because actually I, I have a, we have another show coming up. Interview to do. Uh, just gone over I, I've already, I've booked another hour for this, so we're just going to keep talking. We can, we can come back, but we have to do the other show first. <laughs> I'm, 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 I'm still going to be doing this show. I, no one it gonna, just keeps going. It just keeps that much fun. I'm just going to keep yes ending myself. And I just want to say that also, this was the inaugural episode where I also beamed you into my TikTok for the first half of the Ooh, show. TikTok. So we had a lot of TikTok people. Uh, so my I sister wanted... is a huge TikTok fan. I wonder if she's watching. I hope. Yeah. She's. Well, you know, so that we were live for that, but we want to have you back, Mike, because of that. Now we're talking the, now. The well, my, when it. my book comes out, I will be love to to tell you like yeah, yeah, sure the link to say that you yeah. can actually buy the book. Um, I, I'm really yeah. excited. I, I think the book is going to do a lot of um, good for people, so I'm really excited to share it. And, um, and I'm excited yeah, to read it too. We'll do that in advance. That would be the, the fun thing. I'll, 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 you guys will I'll give you an advance copy so you can you can. Uh, even, oh man! You can write, you can write me an Amazon. Thank you. Thank awesome. you so Thank much. Four stars much. are higher, or I don't want to hear it. <laughs> I don't need any feedback below that. Um, no, I, I would, I'd be happy to. I'd love to. And um, um, I had a good time. I love talking. I just to want you. to tell our fans we'll have a book signing. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah, for sure. Let's do it. A, a, a virtual book signing. I'll sign on it Thursday on Thursday night. Screen. I have to do it like <laughs> nine o'clock. I don't know which way. And funny, funnymuscle.com, correct? Funny That's where they should be going today to, to purchase that. Okay, awesome. Yeah, and okay. I hate to end it, like I said, but we got another show starting. Oh. Do I have separation oh. anxiety. I can't stop. I know, I know. I feel awful of all the. Usually, we usually we don't have another show. This is a one-off that we have. I have to put my comfort wig on. There you go. See, we can have hair hats together. <laughs> Let's do a little modeling, like for you know. Oh, so you got to primp and prep, you know. There you go. Just like that. There you go. I don't think you've seen this wig. <laughs> okay. Well, oh, I like that. Oh man, I want that one. I want the judge wig. Yes, I indeed. Want the judge wig. Bring in the judge. Bring in the judge. Yeah, I would just all day. Guilty! Guilty! He has the gavel. That's what he does. There's a lot of gavel. gavel. Well, yeah, you got to have the gavel. I have um, a retired judge character. <laughs> <laughs> well, I Mike, thank you so for good to see you again, man. Absolutely. And thank Love you, you guys. Thank well, you, everybody. Okay, have a good night. All right. Thank you for watching.